Well, hello, YouTube community. Given uh, the energy that is surrounding my recent book titled Metaphysics of Exolife Toward a Constructive Whiteheadian Cosmotheology, I thought I would share here a new chapter that I'm working on. This is a chapter that will be published in a forthcoming book edited by Ted Peters and several of his colleagues from Stanford, from the University of Santa Clara, as well as the University of South Korea. And this will be a book that he is tentatively titling Astro Anthropology, Science, Ethics, and Religion. It aims to essentially draw out some of the religious, theological, ethical implications of what he has called for many years Astro Theology. So the title of this chapter is Whitehead's Living Ontology, Five Principles of Process Philosophical Astrotheology. Until recently, the resources of Alfred North Whitehead's philosophy of organism have been neglected in current theological explorations of astrobiology and extraterrestrial life. This is unfortunate for at least two reasons. The first concerns the fact that process theology has always been a tradition of cosmic theological reflection, one that, as John B. Cobb Jr. and David Ray Griffin rightly state, intends to think through the meaning for our existence and actions of the space-time scales that scientific cosmology suggests. Embedded within these modern space-time scales is the natural question as to whether life and mind is a rare phenomenon on our planet alone, or utterly pervasive as an inherent part of what Stephen J. Dick has called a biological universe. The second reason concerns the fact that process philosophers and theologians have not been silent on this topic, nor has Whitehead, who is widely recognized as the founding pioneer of the modern process tradition. Indeed, it's often overlooked that Whitehead's magnum opus, Process in Reality, was subtitled an essay in cosmology. At the textual foundations of process philosophical theology, therefore, is a firm conviction that theology and cosmology are relevant to each other and thus that the question of extraterrestrial life is posed for both. This conviction is of no small consequence. As Lewis Ford argued in the first sustained article on extraterrestrial life from a process perspective, theology and cosmology must be relevant to each other if any astral theology or cosmotheology is possible at all. Whitehead, moreover, reminds us that neither theology nor cosmology can proceed without metaphysics, saying, you cannot shelter theology from science or science from theology, nor can you shelter either of them from metaphysics or metaphysics from either of them. There is no shortcut to truth. In an effort to further facilitate the reach and relevance of Whitehead's metaphysics to current philosophical and theological discussions of extraterrestrial life, my aim in this chapter is to elaborate five principles of process philosophical astrotheology. These principles, it should be stressed, are not exhaustive in nature, nor will they be equally affirmed by all process philosophers and theologians. When taken together, however, they not only support the claim that the universe pervades with life, mind, and meaning, but also the claim that it is ultimately good that it should. This discussion then will proceed, proceed through five interrelated headings. One, the anthropic reversal. Two, Retrospective Ontology for Evolutionary Cosmology, 3. Aesthetic Teleology, 4. God as Chief Exemplification and Persuasive Towards Imago Dei, and 5. Goodness, Divine Limitation, and Extraterrestrial Plenitude. I will conclude with a concise summary statement of the principles elaborated under these five headings. The Anthropic Reversal. Principle 1. The cosmos is not anthropomorphic. Rather, human beings are cosmorphic. Central to the methodological starting point of Whitehead's process philosophy is a rejection of the modern tendency to abstract or bifurcate human beings from their locus within and as nature. Put differently, much modern philosophy and science treated human existence and experience as exceptions to, rather than exemplifications of, the nature and character of the world at its most fundamental levels. Not surprisingly, what filled this vacancy was completely foreign to human experience, a reductive, materialistic, and mechanistic world that Whitehead describes as senseless, valueless, purposeless in nature. 
Yet to omit human experience in this way is completely fallacious and renders inadequate the very starting point of one's inquiry. Human experience, Whitehead insists, is as much a part of nature as anything else there, a river or a mountain or a cloud, or, we must add, a nebula or a planet or a star system. What can therefore be termed Whitehead's anthropic reversal concerns the need to re-embed human experience as a fact within the universe, and therefore as the proper starting point for any cosmic reflection as to the nature and character of things, whether terrestrial, extraterrestrial, or divine. Indeed, Whitehead highlights the oddity of reading the human relation to nature in a lopsided or purely unilateral fashion. Consider his emphasis on the need to reverse this when considering factors essential to the emergence of life in the universe. Mankind, he states, has gradually developed from the lowliest forms of life and must therefore be explained in terms applicable to all such forms. But why construe the latter forms by analogy to the earlier forms? Why not reverse the process? It would seem more sensible, more truly empirical, to allow each living species to make its own contribution to the demonstration of factors inherent in living things. For Whitehead, this anthropic reversal should be applied not simply to the attempts to understand the various forms of life that have evolved on this planet, but also to the wider stretches of the cosmos which necessarily condition these forms. Note again, then, his concern for a converse approach to nature through human bodily life. He states, It is the accepted doctrine in physical science that a living body is to be interpreted according to other sections of the physical universe. This is a sound axiom, but it is double-edged. For it carries with it the converse deduction that other sections of the universe are to be interpreted in accordance with what we know of the human body. We should not miss the importance of Whitehead's claim. Human experience is relevant to, and revelatory of, the wider stretches of the cosmos, its billions of planets, its pulsating star systems, and its likely many evolved forms of higher life. In an imaginative statement, Whitehead ponders the remote ages of a lively universe anticipating the birth of life. Our historical knowledge tells us, he states, of ages in the past when, so far as we can see, no living being existed on Earth. Again, it also tells us of countless star systems whose detailed history remains beyond our kin. Consider even the moon and the Earth. What is going on within the interior of the Earth and on the far side of the moon? Our perceptions lead us to think that something is happening in the stars, something happening within the Earth, and something happening on the far side of the moon. Also, they tell us that in remote ages, there were things happening. For Whitehead, human experience is internally connected to what is happening in the countless star systems or in the interior of the Earth or on the far side of the moon. This is what is metaphysically required from the claim that human beings are a fully natural expression of the universe. Whitehead would put it in even stronger fashion, saying any doctrine which refuses to place human experience outside nature must find in descriptions of human experience factors which also enter into the descriptions of less, less specialized natural occurrences. If there be no such factors, he states, then the doctrine of human experience as a fact within nature is mere bluff. Since human experience as a fact in nature is far from bluff, Whitehead insists that the human body provides our closest experience of the interplay of actualities in nature. He thus concludes that we must finally construe the world in terms of the type of activity disclosed in our intimate experience. The activities disclosed in our experience are connected to what is happening in the stars. This is not just romantic sentiment. While Whitehead has at times been charged with anthropomorphizing the cosmos, this is a mistake. As should be clear from his statements, as noted, he is not naively conceiving the cosmos in human form or characteristics. On the contrary, human beings are cosmorphic and necessarily expressive of the deeper shapes and rhythms of cosmic evolution. Neither is this conviction blindly anthropocentric. Rather, it is anthropocosmic in its refusal to bifurcate human beings from their cosmological context. It is this uh, it is within such a context, moreover, 
that a challenge can be leveraged against short-sighted proclamations of our Copernican decentering and utter insignificance of the cosmos. Note that Whitehead, in fact, prima facie accepts the Copernican principle in these terms, and he implicitly challenges philosophers and theologians to take account of this fact by admitting the limitations of our terrestrial systems of thought. And here I quote, the human race consists of a small group of animals, which for a small time has barely differentiated itself from the mass of animal life on a small planet circling around a small sun. The universe is vast. Or elsewhere, any system of thought based on this earth of ours is extremely limited in its conceptions, either theology or philosophy, and most of them have been. We know now that our Earth is an insignificant planet swinging around a second-rate sun in no very important part of the universe. The response to that knowledge of first-rate people talking together should be immeasurably larger than it is. For Whitehead, however, our Copernican decentering is hardly the pinnacle of our cosmological story. At best, it is what he might call a half-truth. Although we remain very small, our experience is actually very large because it expresses the same metaphysical principles that reign throughout the cosmos in various hierarchies of organization, complexity, and intensity. Although our experience is imminent to ourselves, it also transcends us because it is connected to the entire universe as a moving whole. Whitehead, moreover, fully recognizes that to begin approaching human existence and experience as cosmorphic is to begin to marvel at the fact that, quote, in being ourselves, we are more than ourselves. In no small way, it is to begin to discover a real sense of belonging in the universe because, quote, our experience, dim and fragmentary as it is, yet sounds the utmost depths of reality. As we'll see in turning to the next principle, for Whitehead, human experience necessarily expresses organic metaphysical principles that find multitudes of cosmological expression, from nebula to stars, from stars to planets, from inorganic matter to life, from life to reason and moral responsibility. And that's a quote of Whitehead. Retrospective ontology for evolutionary cosmology. Principle two, life, experience, and value are ontological primitives and therefore necessarily ingredient in cosmic evolution. For Whitehead, the endeavors of metaphysics and cosmology are deeply entangled, but they are not the same. Metaphysics is the philosophical investigation into the most general principles of reality, those necessary principles that always find exemplification. As Whitehead states, it is that science which seeks to discover the general ideas which are indispensably relevant to the analysis of everything that happens. By contrast, cosmology consists in the effort to frame a scheme of the general character of the present stage of the universe. Capturing the difference, Lehman McHenry rightly states that metaphysics for Whitehead seeks principles that are necessary for any possible world or cosmic epoch, while cosmology discovers by observation what happens to be the case about our actual world or this cosmic epoch. Once human ex existence and experience are re-embedded in nature and understood to be particular terrestrial expressions of deeper metaphysical principles, we can look nowhere else than to human experience in trying to discern what these principles are. This involves what I call Whitehead's method of retrospective induction. That is the imaginative endeavor to philosophize downward from our experience through levels of reality to see, at least in part, what they too must be like at the most fundamental level. This method is based in the conviction that there is metaphysical uniformity or continuity across nature. As seen above, from the stellar to the planetary to the moral, Whitehead seeks the shared ontological texture that is exhibited across the universe. This method is always tentative in nature, and it must always be in consonance with human experience and the best findings of the sciences. White had argued that mechanistic materialism, with its affirmation of vacuous actuality as the senseless, valueless, purposeless, ontological substratum of the world, was unable to incorporate the revolutionary advances of quantum physics and developmental biology, nor could it adequately explain how life, mind, and value ever evolved 
if their antecedents are wholly absent from the final constituents of reality. At once, therefore, Whitehead's philosophy of organism is a rejection of scientific materialism as a dead ontology and an affirmation of the increasingly blurry divide between physics and biology. Science, he states, is taking on a new aspect which is neither purely physical nor purely biological. It is becoming the study of organisms. Biology is the study of the larger organisms, whereas physics is the study of the smaller organisms. The organisms of biology include as ingredients the smaller organisms of physics. Put differently, the sciences were beginning to reveal the world to be a layered multiplicity of organisms within organisms across various scales of evolutionary emergence and complexity throughout nature. A new organic universe was emerging and with it new theories of its ultimate constituents and character. What had recognized the opportunity, saying the field is now open for the introduction of some new doctrine of organism, which may take the place of the materialism, which with since the 17th century, science has settled philosophy. Whitehead's contributions here are both unique and compelling. At the heart of his metaphysical soil is a living ontology where life, mind, and value are never wholly absent from nature. In no small way, Whitehead's category of organism breathes life back into ontology. As he emphasizes, there is no absolute gap between living and non-living organic systems. Prior to the emergence of what we recognize as living organic systems, then, there are still more fundamental organisms that exhibit active evolution, dynamic response, and purposive internal relations to their environment. Experience appears to demonstrate that organisms may be living or non-living, but non-living does not mean dead. Non-life, or <clears throat> not, light, not yet life, we might say, is the limit case of life, but it may be quite wrong to insist that it is lifeless. Speaking within the context of Whiteheadian ontology, Lewis Ford insists that life is a degree concept, saying, the decisive difference between living and non-living matter is the difference between novel and habitual response. This may well be a matter of degree, such that what we designate as living may simply be those instances where novelty dominates over habit. Here, Ford is echoing Whitehead's own intuition that, quote, an organism can be considered alive when in some measure its reactions are inexplicable by any tradition of pure physical inheritance. This novel reactionary ability, however, which is so fundamental to human life, is never wholly absent even at the far side of primitive ontology for Whitehead. Whitehead's ontology can thus be said to be alive in an important sense. The fundamental organisms of his ontology are living events whose status as living is grounded in the dynamics of their individual and collective becoming, response, and relationality to their universal environment. This principle of rhythmic becoming, Whitehead states, is one of the reasons for believing that the root principles of life are, in some lowly form, exemplified in all types of physical existence. As a hallmark of process metaphysics, becoming is more fundamental than being, and it is these events of creative becoming, what Whitehead terms actual occasions or actual entities, that are the living ontological base of his evolutionary cosmology. Although far removed from our highly evolved lives and capacities, these events form the necessary antecedents of all higher life achieved throughout cosmic evolution. Thus, life in this primitive form belongs inexorably to the universe in its evolution, such that there is no meaning to evolution beyond the higher achievement, complexification, and intensification of life. As Roland Faber has recently argued, life is a universal in Whitehead's universe. Who would have ever dreamed when this earth was a mere molten mass of any such forms of life as have appeared, Whitehead asks. And who that watches the heavens can doubt that forms of life just as amazing exist on other planets? Even stronger, he insists the forms of life which might be lived on other stars millions of light years away and millions hence could be infinite and admit every possibility that the imagination could conceive. We'll see below in another quote, that this might even include the lives of sentient nebula. The livingness of actual entities, I would suggest, is not only linked to their creative becoming, but to the fact that their becoming is the becoming of experience. 
Actual entities are occasions of experience, and they exhibit a dipolar structure in their emergence from the past to the future through phases of physical inheritance, internal reception, mental anticipation, and decision. They not only inherit and receive the objective data of an inrushing past through their physical pull, but also navigate, anticipate, and, quote, decide among unsettled possibilities through, through, uh, for their becoming with their mental pull. The physical and the mental, therefore, belong together in the concrescence of each occasion of experience. Indeed, contrary to scientific bifurcations, mind belongs to nature as an ontological primitive, and it is mind that is the very basis of novelty in nature, such that if nature were mindless, nothing truly novel could ever occur in evolution. As Whitehead insists, mental experience is the organ of novelty, the urge beyond in all finite events, as they vivify the massive physical fact which is repetitive with the novelties which become. Take note of how Whitehead overtly counters scientific abstraction of mind from nature through retrospective logic from human experience. The result is the extension of mental operations throughout nature. And here I quote again. Scientific reasoning is completely dominated by the presupposition that mental functions are not properly part of nature. Accordingly, it disregards all those mental antecedents which mankind habitually presuppose as effective in guiding cosmological functioning. The sharp division between mentality and nature has no ground in our fundamental observation. We find ourselves living within nature. I conclude that we should conceive mental operations as among the factors which make up the constituents of nature. Whitehead thus holds to what David Ray Griffin calls pan-experientialism, where mind, in the form of becoming experience, descends all the way down to the level of ontology. While mental experience is never wholly absent in Whitehead's ontology, it's important to stress that this does not commit him to the claim that consciousness goes all the way down in nature, a claim that's often associated with panpsychism. On the contrary, for Whitehead, consciousness, quote, presupposes experience and not experience consciousness. Consciousness, in other words, is a late emergent phase in the evolution of very complex living organisms involving incredibly layered synchronizations of experience that finally bloom into what Whitehead calls the function of knowing. As Whitehead puts it, consciousness is the crown of experience only occasionally attained, not its necessary base. Stated differently, he insists that, quote, his organic philosophy holds that consciousness can only arise in a later derivative phase of complex integrations of actual occasions. Now, the evolutionary lateness of consciousness notwithstanding, in the primitive form of occasions of experience, the place of mind in nature remains irreducible. So life and experience, therefore, remain tangled concomitants in Whitehead's ontology. As with life, so too with experience. There is also no meaning to evolution beyond the higher achievement, complexification, and intensification of mental experience, and thus the higher achievement of creative novelty throughout the universe. As Charles Hartshorn recognized, such a panpsychist or panexperientialist view, quote, implies the eternal existence of finite minds of some kind in the universe. It's noteworthy that he follows this statement insisting that one of the many ways that this might be verified is by, quote, the discovery of other inhabited planets. Alongside life, if experience, too, is a universal, then a vast and bewildering spectrum, spectrum of novel life, mind, intelligence, and sentience necessarily pervades the universe. Consider, again, the reaches of Whitehead's cosmological wonder. He states, I see no reason to suppose that the air about us and the heavenly spaces over us may not be peopled by intelligences or entities or forms of life as unimaginable to us as we are to the insects. In the scale of size, the difference between the insects and us is nothing to that between us and the heavenly bodies, and who knows? Perhaps the nebula are sentient entities, and what we can see of them are their bodies. That is not more inconceivable then that there may be insects who have acute minds, though their outlook would be narrower than ours. Note here that Whitehead again situates human existence and experience along an imaginative spectrum of life and mind in the universe. 
This vast spectrum runs from the heavenly magnitudes above us to the insects below us and to the air that we breathe. We are part of an infinite series, he insists, and since this series is infinite, we had better take account of that fact and admit into our thinking these infinite possibilities of life and mind. Now, yet another metaphysical dimension must be added to Whitehead's living ontology. The very concepts of life and experience are vacuous without the concept of value. Rejecting the modern divide between fact and value, Whitehead is adamant that we shall never elaborate an explanatory metaphysics unless we abolish this notion of valueless, vacuous existence. He instead praises the poetic response offered by nature poets like Wordsworth, Shelley, and Coleridge to the lifeless nature as portrayed by scientific materialism. Notice again how Whitehead moves retrospectively from human value experience to value experience as pervasive throughout the events of nature. Remembering the poetic rendering of our concrete experience, he states, we see at once that the element of value, of being valuable, of having value, of being an end in itself, of being something which is for its own sake, must not be omitted from any account of an event as the most concrete actual something. Value is the word I use for the intrinsic reality of an event. Value is an element which permeates through and through the poetic view of nature. As the most fundamental throbs of life, experience, and feeling, actual occasions are not valueless for Whitehead, but valuable in and for themselves. They are permeated with intrinsic value in their very reality of becoming. In this way, the world bears witness to what Whitehead describes as the becomingness of real values. So just as life and experience go all the way down in nature, therefore, so too does value. Whitehead's philosophy is thus not only pan-experientialism, but also what Victor Lowe calls pan-valueism. Indeed, as Nathaniel Barrett has recently argued, Whitehead's pan-experientialism is also a pan-axiological view of nature. Life, experience, and value, therefore, belong together in Whiteheadian ontology such that, <clears throat> such that he conceives the very becoming into being, uh, the concrescence, of each actual occasion as a living valuational process where possibilities of value are experientially felt or prehended, actualized, and then passed on to the birth of subsequent occasions. As Philip Rose rightly states, to be, for Whitehead, is to be the source of values given and a center of values felt. Value is inherent in the making of fact, and fact is an attainment of value. As with life and experience, then, so, too, with value. There is no meaning to evolution beyond the progressive reach for deeper intrinsic value. Life, experience, and value necessarily rise together in the achievements of cosmological evolution. Aesthetic teleology. Principle three. The telos of cosmic evolution is the aesthetic increase and intensification of what is ontologically primitive. Where life, experience, and value are conceived to be metaphysical ingredients of cosmological evolution, progressive teleology has an abiding ontological root. The evolutionary process has borne witness to the higher achievement of life, experience, and value the denial of which strains credulity. The, quote, aboriginal stuff of materialistic philosophy, Whitehead stresses, is incapable of evolution, and the only world it can produce is what he describes as purposeless and unprogressive. This is hardly the kind of world we inhabit. Whitehead, in fact, mocks what Michael Levin rightly calls the teleophobia of scientists who are apt to ignore clear evidence of foresight and purpose in the animal world not least in themselves as part of the animal world. Whitehead states many a scientist has patiently designed experiments for the purpose of substantiating his belief that animal operations are motivated by no purposes. He has perhaps spent spare time in writing articles to prove that human beings are as other animals, so that purpose is a category irrelevant for the explanation of their bodily activities, his own activities included. Scientists animated by the purpose of proving they are purposeless constitute an interesting subject of study. 
Now, when we retrospectively review the ascendant lure of evolution towards higher life experience and value, Whitehead insists that we see a drive from mere existing to an aesthetic quality of existing. What we see in evolution is, quote, the development of enduring harmonies, of enduring shapes of value, which merge into higher attainments of things beyond themselves, he states. Aesthetic attainment, he continues, is interwoven in the texture of realization, and the endurance of an entity represents the attainment of a limited aesthetic success. The progressive complexification of life and experience are themselves aesthetic achievements of an evolutionary process that transcends mere survival. Whitehead thus conceives the evolutionary advance to be grounded in a threefold qualitative urge, to be alive or to live, to be alive in a satisfactory way or to live well, and to acquire an increase in satisfaction or to live better. For Whitehead, aesthetic value remains the widest and the most inclusive form of value applicable to the universe at all scales. There are real, real standards of value and possibilities of achievable value in the form of life and experience that are presupposed but not explained by the evolutionary process. All order is aesthetic order. Even the order exhibited in the laws of nature and the presupposed formational abilities of our world. As Charles Hartshorn emphasized, the most general principles of harmony and intensity are more ultimate than the laws of physics and are the reason for there being natural laws at all. Put differently, the laws of nature are already an expression of deeper aesthetic principles in the nature of things. These statements by Hartshorn merely echo Whitehead's own conviction that, quote, the foundations of the world are grounded in the aesthetic order and that the world itself is the outcome of the aesthetic order. Note that this order is prior to the world, as Whitehead clarifies, saying it is not the case that there is an actual world which accidentally happens to exhibit an order of nature. There is an actual world because it is, there is an order of nature. If there were no order, there would be no world. Also, since there is a world, we know that there is an order. For Whitehead, then, this order is fundamentally aesthetic. Just as conscious life dawns through compounding synchronizations of highly evolved occasions of experience for Whitehead, so too does moral value dawn in the context of highly evolved forms of aesthetic value, namely conscious life. The moral order is merely certain aspects of the aesthetic order, Whitehead states. That aesthetic order is deeper than moral value, or that aesthetic value is deeper than moral value is a statement as to the evolutionary origins and roots of morality. Indeed, there are primitive stages of the universe where moral value is simply not applicable for Whitehead. Yet, there is no stage of the universe where aesthetic value is not applicable. For example, Whitehead speaks of some early epoch of the universe in which the dominant trend was the formation of protons, electrons, molecules, and stars, he states. While moral or ethical activity makes little sense in this context, aesthetic activity and, achieve, and achievement are replete. For protons, electrons, molecules, and stars are themselves achievements of aesthetic order. For Whitehead, then, moral order presupposes aesthetic order. All levels of life and experience exhibit hierarchies of aesthetic value attainment, and is only within this context that morality can arise. Put differently, the ethical and moral dimensions of human experience and by extension extraterrestrial experience, are awakened evolutionary expressions of the primordiality of aesthetic value experience as it pervades nature. As Lewis Ford states, with the emergence of conscious alternatives of actions, ethics becomes possible. For now, some alternatives may be experienced as better and others as worse. Whitehead, in fact, insists that persistent intuitions like better or worse, importance and ideals, are ultimate notions that haunt life and mind in the universe. We have awoken to these ultimate ideals on our planet, and so too will any other planet where conscious life meets or exceeds our capacities. It is within this context that David Ray Griffin speaks of extraterrestrial commonality, saying, on our planet, or on other planets, with the conditions for life to emerge and to evolve for many billions of years, we should expect there to be some with creatures that, no matter how different in physical constitution and appearance, would share some of our capacities, such as those for mathematics, 
music, and morality, or more generally, truth, beauty, and goodness. Nevertheless, that morality can and will arise on other planets in Whitehead's universe is not to say that morality or ethics can be rigidly codified in ways that are universally applicable to all beings in the cosmos. Whitehead, in fact, strongly rejected this, saying, the notion that there are certain regulative notions sufficiently precise to prescribe details of conduct for all reasonable beings on Earth, in every planet, and in every star system is at once to be put aside. Such an idea for Whitehead is based in the notion that there is, quote, one type of perfection at which the universe aims. In denying this, he insists that all realization of the good is finite and necessarily excludes certain other types. What goodness means for other intelligent beings may well be beyond the bounds of our imagination, Lewis Ford, too, admits. But it might be just possible, he says, to define a general criterion underlying all concrete embodiments. For Ford, as for Whitehead, this general criterion has to do with the expansion of freedom and intensity toward beautiful ends. Now, in the context of current philosophy of astrobiology, if the universe is termed biocentric, uh, say, rather than anthropocentric or anthropic, it is only because at a deeper level it is already organic, experiential, and aesthetic in nature. For Whitehead, these are the metaphysical preconditions without which higher life, mind, and value could not be produced at all. Whitehead, I trust, would then agree with what John F. Hott has called the aesthetic cosmological principle. This principle insists upon the universal tendency toward the creation of value and beauty, of which human subjective emergence, human life, is but one possible expression alongside a myriad of others in the universe. Indeed, in an early article, Hott indicated that process theology is already inherently open to being developed into a theology after contact. This is due not only to its embrace of a universe still in the process of being created, but also to its teleological conception of this process in terms of aesthetic purposes. So consider Hott's comment. He says, contemporary process theology, with its vision of cosmic purpose, is expansive enough to accommodate the discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence. For the process philosopher Alfred North Whitehead and his theological followers, the purpose of the cosmos consists of its aim towards the intensification of beauty. Since, at least for Whitehead, beauty is an intrinsic value, any process that leads toward its establishment could be called teleological, at least in a loose sense. Beauty, in Whitehead's thought, means the harmony of contrasts or the ordering of novelty, many diverse instances of which have appeared in the evolution of the cosmos and in the emergence of life, mind, and culture in our terrestrial setting. Hott would go on to put it succinctly, the aim towards aesthetic intensity is the central theme of the cosmic story, and subjectivity is the most intense concentration of the cosmic aim towards beauty. In saying this, he is simply restating Whitehead's own fundamental refrain, namely that the teleology of the universe is directed toward the production of beauty. God as chief exemplification and persuasive towards Imago Dei. Principle four. God is the chief exemplification of life, experience, and value in the universe, operating through universal persuasion and seeking reflection and refraction throughout the universe. Fundamental metaphysical questions arise for Whitehead's universe. What renders a universe of this nature and character possible at all? What accounts for its metaphysical stability? Where do standards of value and possibilities of value come from? What indeed explains the emergence of each event among such possibilities and values? Fundamental questions of meaning also confront us. What finally comes of the values achieved through cosmological evolution? Do they simply pass into nothingness and dissolve as if they never were? Whitehead's astrotheology, or cosmotheology, addresses these ultimate questions of metaphysics and meaning in an evolutionary cosmos. As noted already, it is not only the case that theology and cosmology must be relevant to each other if any astral theology is possible at all, but also, and perhaps more so, the case that theology and metaphysics must be relevant to each other. 
One of Whitehead's most adamant critiques of the theological tradition is that it inappropriately paid God, quote, metaphysical compliments. That is, God was made to be a supernatural exception to the metaphysical depths of the world, such that an unbridgeable chasm obtained. The theologians, he states, made no effort to conceive the world in terms of the metaphysical categories by which they interpreted God, and they made no effort to conceive God in terms of the metaphysical categories which they applied to the world. There was a gulf between them. Note that the result of this gulf is the complete incoherence of any rational approach to astrotheology, and thus any knowledge as to God's relationship to ourselves and other extraterrestrial life and intelligence in the universe. If, as Whitehead stresses, God is completely outside metaphysical rationalization, such that there is no metaphysical mutuality between God and the world, then cosmology and theology are finally irrelevant for each other, for there is no coherent way to move from the world to God and back again. And here I quote Whitehead's comments. Any philosophical investigation which commences with the consideration of the character of the world cannot rise above the actuality of this world. It can only discover all the factors disclosed in the world as experienced. In other words, it may discover an imminent God, but not a God wholly transcendent. The difficulty can be put in this way. By considering the world, we can find all the factors required by the total metaphysical situation but we cannot discover anything not included in this totality of fact, and yet explanatory of it. God, for Whitehead then, must be a part of the factors required by the total metaphysical situation. As such, God is profoundly imminent in the world. This does not mean that God in no way transcends the world, however. On the contrary, Whitehead emphasizes that both imminence and transcendence belong to his astrotheology. The notion of God, he states, is of an actual entity imminent in the actual world but transcending any finite cosmic epoch, a being at once actual, eternal, imminent, and transcendent. Indeed, this panentheism seeks to avoid extremes of imminence and transcendence which have been traditionally expressed by, quote, the pantheistic doctrine of God as essentially imminent and in no way transcendent, and the extreme monotheistic doctrine of God as essentially transcendent and only accidentally imminent. By inverting the long-standing habit of paying God metaphysical compliments, Whitehead effectively charts a new path of naturalistic philosophical astrotheology. In the first place, he famously states, God is not to be treated as an exception to all metaphysical principles invoked to save their collapse. He is their chief exemplification. The radicalism of this statement is that God, too, is to be understood in terms of the same metaphysical conditions expressed throughout the cosmos, albeit preeminently. Rather than supernaturally establishing these conditions, God is their embodied context and culmination. It is this radical move for Whitehead that categorically bars so-called supernatural action from the outside of the world and makes divine activity part and parcel of the world's normal natural causes and never their competition or interruption. God's role is not the combat of productive force with productive force or destructive force with destructive force, Whitehead insists. Rather, following Plato, the divine element is to be understood as a persuasive agency and not as a coercive agency. The world, in other words, does not submit, quote, to the imposed will of a transcendent God. Rather, Whitehead says, the existence in nature are sharing in the nature of the imminent God. Competitive and coercive action is thereby metaphysically denied in Whitehead's astrotheology. This is not insignificant, for as David Ray Griffin underscores, any philosophical or theological position must explain why our world and the vast plurality of worlds have come about through an inconceivably long evolutionary process. This question is difficult for traditional theism, given its doctrine of omnipotence based on Caracio ex nihilo, according to which there was no necessity for our world to have come about through wrong, a long, slow evolutionary process, Griffin states. He goes on to stress that this question is equally difficult for atheism, given its view that there is no purpose behind the evolutionary process, which makes the upward trend wholly mysterious. Whitehead's naturalistic astral theology responds to both quandaries. The evolutionary trend has been upward because the divine impetus always seeks richer achievement of what is ontologically implicit, 
namely life experience and value. And this process has taken so incredibly long because divine power is always persuasive and never coercive in nature. God's power then is God's indefatigable patience that persuades the cosmos to reach its highest potentialities. Consider again Lewis Ford, who describes God's cosmological function in these terms. God's cosmological function consists in supplying that impetus towards greater complexification we discover operative throughout the natural order. This does not mean that God acts efficiently as one of the causal antecedent conditions out of which the present event emerges. We do not wish to repeat the fundamental error of those who portray God as the maker or mechanic or artisan of the world. For all these images imply that God forms the world through force or coercion. Rather, he serves as a lure for actualization, providing novel possibilities of achievement, thereby persuading each creature to create itself. As the chief exemplification of metaphysical principles, God too then is conceived as an all-encompassing event of life, experience, and value in intimate relation to every terrestrial and extraterrestrial event whose becoming, as we've seen, is also characterized in these same terms. John Cobb and Charles Birch have argued that, quote, the Whiteheadian idea of God is appropriately called life, not only because the imminence of God in the world is the life-giving principle, but also because the life-giving principle is itself alive. For them, this follows inexorably because, quote, life, a lifeless principle, could not ground or explain the urge to aliveness that permeates the universe. God at life, they state, does not aim specifically at the creation of human beings on our planet, but rather achieves rich value in dolphins as well as humans. They state, we cannot guess the forms it may have achieved on other worlds. Indeed, for Whitehead, it is God's initial aim that ultimately gives life to each occasion so that it can become into being as a living, experiencing, and valuing entity. It is the divine lure for life that persuasively coaxes the evolutionary process towards higher value, to live, to live well, to live better. Process astral theology thus affirms God as the life without which there is no life, not even its possibility. Analogous to the mental poles of finite occasions, which navigate the limited set of possibilities and values relevant to their own becoming, what, what Whitehead calls the primordial nature of God is the divine mental pole, which encompasses infinite possibility and value with strategic urge for their realization in the world. As noted above, for Whitehead, a cosmos of creative evolutionary becoming presupposes the indispensability of possibility, but he is not unaware of the layered metaphysical issues that are involved. These are related issues surrounding the ontological status, limitation, relevance, and efficacy of the possible for the actual in the creative advance of things. It's not obvious where possibilities are ontologically, how it is they can exist, or how they can exhibit causal relations and relevance to a fluid evolutionary world. For Whitehead, possibilities cannot be nowhere, nor are they nothing. Rather, they are contents of mind. A fundamental metaphysical correlation thus emerges for his astral theology. Where there is possibility, there is mind. And where there is infinite and necessary possibility, there is infinite and necessary mind. In this way, Whitehead's astral theology affirms what he says is a doctrine of conceptualism, which, when viewed from its highest metaphysical perspective, coincides with the primordial mind of God. I think the universe has a side which is mental and permanent, he states. The side is that prime conceptual drive which I call the primordial nature of God. It is out of this timeless depth of permanent mentality that God offers God's self to the evolutionary process in the form of achievable possibility and value. God is thereby conceived to be the cosmic mind without which there's no possibility and value at all. Analogously to the physical poles of actual occasions, which inherit and receive the objective past and the formation of themselves, so too does Whitehead's God have a consequent nature, which truly experiences, receives, and evolves through incorporating the world process in every moment. This is not to be conceived as a passive process, but an active process, one of receptive transformation that is based in divine sympathy 
and compassion. The consequent nature of God is the realization of the actual world in the unity of God's nature and through the transformation of his wisdom, White it states. God is consequent, then, is the preservation of the past and the ground of truth. The truth itself, Whitehead states, is nothing else than how the composite natures of the organic actualities of the world obtain adequate representation in the divine nature. Such representations compose the consequent nature of God, which evolves in its relationships to an evolving world. Just as there would be no possibility and thus no novel future without the primordial nature, so too for Whitehead there would be no truth and thus no preserved past without the all-receptive evolution of divine experience in the consequent nature. Another metaphysical correlation thus emerges for Whiteheadian astrotheology. Where there is truth of any kind, there is impartial divine reception of that truth as distinguished from what might have otherwise been. Now, Whitehead knows well that a cosmos of becoming and perishing weighs upon its inhabitants through existential angst, longing, and inevitable loss. The ultimate evil of the temporal world is deeper than any specific evil, he states. It lies in the fact that the past fades, that time is a perpetual perishing. In the temporal world, he continues, it's an empirical fact that process entails loss. So what indeed comes of our experience, of all experience in the universe? Is there any resolution to the conflicting and discordant dimensions of striving, anxiety, and turmoil? Can any ultimate significance be assigned to our life, to any life in the planet on which we've emerged, if we all inevitably perish into nothingness? For Whitehead, the world does not perish into nothingness. It perishes into the consequent nature of God, where it is imprinted, remembered, and judged against the ideals of the divine nature. The consequent nature of God is his judgment on the world, he states. He saves the world as it passes into the immediacy of his own life. It is a judgment of a tenderness which loses nothing that can be saved. It is also the judgment of a wisdom which uses what in the temporal world is mere wreckage. As such, the consequent nature is also the ground of meaning the memory and preservation of accomplished fact in the universe. As Daniel A. Dombrowski states, divine memory in this sense is, quote, the paradigm case of experiencing and provides the avenue by which to best understand why perpetual perishing is not the last word. God is not a mere spectator, but a participant in the process of the world with ideal memory. The divine memory, then, is that without which there is no truth or meaning at all. For Whitehead's process astral theology, therefore, God is pictured as persuasively guiding cosmic evolution with the ingredients of God's own life, so that it will reflectively conform to the divine nature and character. In so doing, as Whitehead insists, God is the mirror which discloses to every creature its own greatness. The emergence of Imago Dei in ourselves and extraterrestrial others is a collaborative evolutionary achievement between God and the world. The very unfolding of cosmic evolution is the making explicit of what is implicit and constituent of the divine nature as it is shared with the world. Goodness, divine limitation, and extraterrestrial plenitude. Principle 5. God's necessary goodness is necessarily self-diffusive and thereby seeks multiplication, multiplicity, and cosmological plenitude. At the heart of Whitehead's process, astrotheology, is the conviction that God is good. God's persuasion of the world towards truth, beauty, and goodness extends from the divine nature, which is the ultimate ground of these objective ideals, as they are realized in and through cosmological evolution. The claim that God is good is not an arbitrary supposition for Whitehead. God does not happen to be good when God might have been evil, rather necessary goodness belongs to the divine nature, and is ultimately justifying in ways that evil simply is not. Goodness, Whitehead describes, as the ultimate qualification not to be analyzed in terms of anything more final than itself. This is an essential point that transcends Whitehead's own conviction. As I've argued elsewhere, Whitehead is part of an eminent tradition of philosophical theology which variously insists that goodness or value is the ultimate reason for divine and worldly existence. This is not a logical explanation of God and the world, but an axiological explanation 
with enduring historical roots. For Whitehead, to insist that God's nature is good not only assumes real limitations on possibility, as they are divinely offered to the world, but also real limitations on God. Denying that God is agothic ecological, or an admixture of good and evil, Whitehead states it is not true that God is in all respects infinite. If he were, he would be evil as well as good. Whitehead finds this claim incoherent since, quote, this unlimited fa fashion, or excuse me, fusion of evil with good would mean mere nothingness. Rather, he insists that God is something decided and is thereby limited. As for the nature of this limitation in God, Whitehead is overt, saying the limitation of God is his goodness. Now, Whitehead recognizes this claim as inherent in the theological tradition, although he stresses that it was not held consistently. When discussing the doctrinal squabbles of Christianity in trying to just grasp the relationship between the finite and infinite, for example, he notes that the, quote, very notion of goodness was conceived in terms of active opposition to the powers of evil and thereby in terms of the limitation of deity. In clarifying that, quote, such limitation was explicitly denied and implicitly accepted, he signals the incoherence of holding that God is both unlimited and good. On the contrary, if God provides determinate limitations on an infinite possibility, so a world of value and goodness can emerge, then God's own limitation must be conceived in terms of goodness. Indeed, God's goodness is, we might say, God's counter agathic ecological restraint. Now, this final claim of divine omnibenevolence, I would suggest, is essential to astrotheological justifications of a plurality of worlds in extraterrestrial life. As the tradition is long held, it belongs to divine goodness to be necessarily self-diffusive, to give of itself endlessly to benevolent and worthwhile ends. Put differently, the divine desire is for the universe to be all that it can be on behalf of truth, beauty, and goodness. In the context of process philosophical astrotheology, the affirmation of divine goodness intimately unites two fundamental facts of human experience, namely, continuous creation, Caratio continua, and sheer cosmological plenitude. These facts are expressed in and through us in the billions of planets, stars, and forms of life, experience, and value that pervade the universe. In the final analysis, Whitehead's philosophy is a philosophy of multiplicity and plenitude because of the self-diffusion of divine beatitude. We need then only conclude by revisiting his plenitudinous wonder. Quote, the forms of life which might be lived on other stars millions of light years away and millions hence could be infinite and admit every possibility that the imagination could conceive. Five Principles of Process Philosophical Astrotheology The aim of this chapter has been to demonstrate the reach and relevance of Whitehead's living ontology toward a process philosophical astrotheology. With roots in Whitehead's essay in Cosmology, process theology remains a tradition of cosmic theological reflection, one that affirms the mutual relevance of cosmology, theology, and metaphysics to each other. As discussions concerning the philosophical and theological implications and or justifications of astrobiology and extraterrestrial life continue, my hope is that Whitehead's philosophy of organism and the insights of past and present process philosophers and theologians will henceforth be included. While not exhaustive in nature, the five principles expounded in this chapter are directed towards this end. One, the cosmos is not anthropomorphic. Rather, human beings are cosmorphic. Two, life, experience, and value are ontological primitives and therefore necessarily ingredient in cosmic evolution. Three, the telos of cosmic evolution is the aesthetic increase and intensification of what is ontologically primitive. 4. God is the chief exemplification of life, experience, and value in the universe, operating through universal persuasion and seeking reflection and refraction throughout the universe. And 5. God's necessary goodness is necessarily self-diffusive and thereby seeks multiplication, multiplicity, and cosmological plenitude.